So this was a pocket notebook kept by Sir Isaac Newton in the middle of the 17th century when he was a young man at the very end of his career at grammar school in his late teen years and the very beginning of his career at Trinity College, Cambridge University. As you can see in this image on, on the right um, showing the measurements of the notebook, it is quite small. It is less than five inches long. It's roughly the size of a modern smartphone. And like a smartphone, it was portable and it contained specifically portable types of information and texts. So that's an important consideration when, when thinking about this notebook. It's not a rough draft of a scientific paper or treatise. It's not a diary of daily life. Rather, it is a paper repository for information Newton encountered while reading or while conversing with people he met in his life. Um, it does offer some interesting clues as to what Newton was reading and doing in these early years um, at the end of his grammar school education and beginning of his university career. So this notebook starts as Newton does himself in Lincolnshire. This is the Woolsthorpe Manor House, um, the family farm where Newton was born and grew up. Newton's family was a, a group of illiterate yeomen who had slowly amassed land, wealth, and most importantly, sheep over the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, but they were illiterate and the educational impulse um, that, that brought Newton to school really came from his mother and grandmother. They ensured that he went to various day schools uh, in, in rural Lincolnshire. And later in 1655, that he started grammar school at the King's School in Grantham, about seven miles from Lincolnshire. This was a typical grammar school education of the 17th century, primarily in Latin with a little bit of Greek um, for boys. Uh, when Newton was living, um, was going to school in Grantham, he lived with an apothecary named Mr. Clark. And this apothecary may be the source for some of the chemical recipes and combinations that uh, I'll be talking about shortly that are found in this notebook and are quite fascinating. Here's an inscription uh, of, by Isaac Newton uh, as a boy at the King's School at Grantham uh, in, a, in a stone windowsill with a not so professional looking label there, but the, the inscription is quite nice. So he started school in 1655 and would stay there until 1659 when his mother called him back to the family farm in Woolsthorpe so he could learn how to manage the estate and take it over. Uh, as you might imagine, Newton hated this experience. Uh, there are amazing anecdotes of Newton absentmindedly reading a book while uh, trying to care for sheep and the sheep run away and are lost and it's a big financial issue and all that. Um, so needless to say, he hated every moment of being back on the family farm. And nine months later, thanks to the intervention of his uncle and the headmaster of the grammar school in Grantham, he was back for his last year of school in preparation for a university. So you can see this is the, the inscription at the very beginning of the Morgan notebook um, that Newton started this notebook in 1659. Um, he lists the price he paid for it, um, and this is probably right when he got back to Woolsthorpe, when he was bored to tears trying to learn farming and probably surrounded by books that were owned by his stepfather, um, including some of the books he may have read while compiling this manuscript. So much of the notebook, especially the bits written in the um, earlier handwriting, and I'll sit, pause for a moment and say that the notebook has two distinct forms of handwriting of Newton's. One earlier and more of a schoolboy hand that he probably learned in grammar school, and another later form um, that he would really use for the rest of his life. So we can see, based on the handwriting, the, the time, uh, the different time periods in which he was keeping this notebook. So much of this text, as I mentioned, is derived from his reading, in particular from a fascinating book by John Bate titled The Mysteries of Nature and Art, first published in 1634. So we know next to nothing about this John Bate outside of the contents of this book, uh, but we do know that this was the first major English work on waterworks and hydraulic machines. It's divided into four sections, the first on waterworks, we know from contemporary anecdotes that Newton constructed a water clock while he was in Woolsthorpe. The uh, image on the far right here um, is probably the clock that he constructed. So he probably used this book to figure that out. He also constructed models of water and windmills as a boy. So he may have read this book and learned how to do that um, earlier on. The second book is on fireworks. And we also know from contemporary anecdotes that Newton 
uh, would create these fiery flaming kites known as fire drakes. They would be dipped in oil. They would have firecrackers and lanterns attached to their tails. Um, quite dangerous and they certainly frightened some of the townspeople in Woolsthorpe, but Newton may have read about these as well from this book. The third part of Bates book, Mysteries of Nature and Art, is on drawing and painting, coloring. You can see another image here. We know that Newton painted portraits of John Donne, King Charles I in Woolsthorpe. We know that he drew pictures all over the walls of the apothecary's house he lived at, uh, lived at in Grantham. So we knew he had an artistic predilection of some sort, even though he did not pursue that career, of course. And then finally, the fourth book of John Bate is the book of extravagance or miscellaneous content, including many medicinal recipes. And I really love this image here on the left, how to make a light burn under the water being a very pretty concept to take fish. I don't know exactly how this works, but some sort of candle um, under a, a pond as a way to catch fish. So some very strange material in this book. Newton's focus, of course, was on the last two sections of Bates' book, those on drawing and painting and those on recipes. And I'm gonna toggle now over to the digital facsimile, which you can see here. This is the, the front cover, the opening of it, the inscription there, and the very beginning of the book here of drawing. You can see Newton is listing instruments of drawing, how to draw or paint drapery, how to draw or paint landscape or landscape. He's very fascinated with colors in this book. And I wanna show you a few of the recipes he includes for making colors. So you can see here a sea color, a yellow color, a hair color. On the next page, a russet color, a color for faces. So not just colors themselves, but colors of specific kinds of figures or images one would like to paint. Colors for naked pictures, a color for dead corpse. The spelling is quite interesting in this, and I'll talk about handwriting a bit in a, in a little while. A blood red color, one of which involves using sheep's blood. So some very interesting organic compounds, the ingredients he's using uh, to create these colors are, are quite fascinating for art history, of course, as well. Colors for different garments. This fascination with color is really interesting because it would inform his later study of light, which culminated in his great masterpiece, Optics of 1704. Uh, in this work, his basic argument is that white light can be conceived of as a heterogeneous composition containing a spectrum of colors. And he demonstrated this in his experiments using prisms, basically that each color in the spectrum would refract at a different angle. And Newton, you may not know this, was the first person to use the word spectrum in this sense. Before that, it was really used to refer to an apparition or a ghost. So quite, quite interesting first use of spectrum there. A bit later in the manuscript, we have Newton copying some material from the fourth book of Bate on extravagance or uh, extra miscellaneous content. You can see on this page, he includes a recipe on melting metal or to make glue to make wood or bone red always. But then he also includes some interesting uh, recipes for catching fish and birds. So we have here a bait to catch fish. And perhaps the strangest recipe to us as modern viewers to make birds drunk. Um, we'll read this one out real quick. Uh, take such meat as they love as wheat, barley, etc. Steep it in lees of wine or in the juice of hemlock and sprinkle it where the birds used to haunt, where the birds like to hang out, essentially. So this was some way of either catching birds or uh, controlling a bird population that might descend upon a field of crops, for instance. And you can see here, and this is why manuscripts like this are so fascinating, you can see a, a, a last line here in a slightly different ink and in a different hand. This is a, Newton's later hand. So he's going back and he's adding more information to this recipe later in life. And he writes, sodden garlic sprinkled amongst corn sown. So maybe dip, dip, this, dip garlic into this compound, into this mixture, and sow it among your wheat in your field. And that is one way of controlling the bird population, say. So at least when it came to the scientific uh, applications of farming, Newton was a bit more engaged than uh, the idea of, of course, managing an entire state. So I want to, for a second, pause 
and talk about handwriting. So the form of handwriting Newton is using is quite interesting in the 17th century. Um, in England, there had been a form, a uh, script known as the secretary script, common from around 1500 to the 1630s or 40s. You can see here uh, a plate uh, with the form of the alphabet and over here a guide that paleographers use for some of the many letter forms and the many variations each letter form can take. You can see that C, R, especially look quite strange, E as well, and P too. And if we look at a page from Newton's notebook, we can see the sort of missile, uh, the, the mixed quality of his handwriting. So the 17th century was a time when handwriting was evolving. It was a momentous era of change in English handwriting. And you have what's called a mixed hand that really becomes dominant. So you can see some of the earlier forms, this R here, the C here in much, for instance, the backwards E here. These are all older forms that Newton would have learned at the grammar school, probably from an older writing master. Other letter forms that look more modern, like the H here in much, the K in Lockwood, the D. So it's a time when a, a more recognizable hand, italic hand, was mixing with an earlier and more unrecognizable form of handwriting, secretary script. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the manuscript now. And let's see, we also have some interesting medicinal recipes uh, recorded in the manuscript. Of course, this was a time when many household remedies were kept in such manuscript notebooks um, alongside perhaps recipes for food and other culinary um, creations in the kitchen. So these are interesting because they do not come from this book, this printed book Newton was reading. They come from some source we can't really trace at all. Um, we see the recipe here says to make the balsam of Vincent Lancelles, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's used for all these different kinds of medical ailments. So Vincent Lancelles, we don't know too much about him other than that he was a itinerant Venetian doctor who was around England in the 1650s. He was essentially a mountebank, a quack doctor of some kind. And here Newton has recorded several recipes from this man uh, that don't come from any printed books. Maybe Newton met him. Maybe Newton knew someone who had met him. In any case, he did think it uh, wise to record these recipes here in his book. We have also over here an ointment uh, for all uh, to make his ointment, again, referencing Vincent Lancelles. So we have this sense of some of the content of the notebook not coming from printed sources, but perhaps, perhaps from oral sources. I really love this page here, which is headed helps for the eyesight, uh, for ye eyesight. I can talk more about that later if you have any questions about why the why is a th. Um, and he, he lists things hurtful for the eyes and things good for the sight. So hurtful for the eyes, some of these are quite familiar to us, garlic, onions, and leeks. Um, some not so familiar to us, overmuch lettuce. Uh, we see cold air, drunkenness, gluttony, even some colors, white and red colors much sleep after meat, dust, fire, much weeping and watching. And then things good for the sight, measurable sleep. We can all attest to that, absolutely. Uh, different herbs and, and vegetables. Um, to wash your eyes in fair running water and your hands and feet often. To look on any green or pleasant colors or in a fair glass. I think it's interesting that he's thinking about color as something harmful or helpful to eyesight. And again, we have to remember Newton, Newton's interest in color, his interest in vision. And I think those are coming through here uh, uh, again. Newton famously conducted a, a rather horrific experiment on himself in which he stuck a flat needle into the bottom of his eye to see if he could produce any kind of colors in his vision by manipulating his eyeball. And so he was very interested in eyes, obviously. We have here down here some recipes for different kinds of eye drops. Okay, this, this is one of my favorite parts of the manuscript. This section is just titled Certain Tricks, and these are basically parlor tricks, conjuring tricks, and they give a sense of Newton not only as the serious scientist, but as a teenager, as someone who may be playing a practical joke on someone. 
uh, creating a parlor trick of some kind. These are also not traceable to any printed books. Uh, this one is uh, titled To Turn Waters Into Wine, first into Claret, which is a, uh, a light red wine. And I'll read this out. Uh, Take as much Lockwood, this is Logwood, um, used for dyes uh, in later periods, as well as this one. Take as much Lockwood as you can hold in your mouth without discovery. Tie it up in a cloth and put it in your mouth. Then sup up some water and champ the Lockwood three or four times and do it out into a glass. So you're taking this little ball of wood in a cloth, trying to hide it in your mouth so no one knows it's there, drink up some water, chew this Lockwood, and then spit back out a, a reddish mixture into the glass. So I don't know how easy it would have been to pull this off and convince anyone, um, but nonetheless, this is a recipe uh, Newton has in his notebook. And there's an X mark next to it in Newton's hand, which may suggest that he tried this out. Some of the recipes do not have X marks. We see over here, um, how to turn water into sack, into sky colored blue wine, um, for posset drink or curds, and for strong waters as well. Okay, so moving right along, you guys have seen this image um, probably on our website and social media posts about this notebook. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful spreads and fascinating looking spreads, I think, in the whole, in the whole text. And this is a section in the notebook where we really start to see more scientific information that Newton is recording. Um, Newton was a keen observer of the sun, the moon, heavenly bodies. And none of this information in here, which is primarily astronomical and astrological data of various kinds, seems to come from any printed books. This probably derives from Newton's actual personal observations of the sun, the moon, and the stars. So we can see here the months of the year, 12, 1, 2, 3, signs of the zodiac. If you know your zodiac symbols, those might come in handy right now. Observations about the moon and sun in relation to each other in the sky. I'm gonna do a, a trick here real quick and flip this page over. There we go. So we can read it. Uh, this is a chart of different years starting with 1662 and going through 1689, recording various bits of information um, including the prime number, which is a, a number that was used to calculate the date of Easter, um, the epact, which was a, a, a number that referred to the age of the moon at the beginning of each month, and also some other information related to feast days and what years they fall on Sunday. And so a lot of information that would have been quite useful at the time, which today seems kind of extraneous or, or strange to, to consider, but would have been very fascinating uh, to Newton. Another two pages have a very similar look in terms of grids of data. So we have, I'm not gonna flip this one over, but a table, a table for determining movable feasts, a list of the different law and college terms, Easter term, Trinity term, et cetera. And over here, some astronomical data related to stars, especially the fixed stars. And I just love some of the names of these. Antares, or the scorpion's heart the bright star of the dragon's head, so sort of been in the constellation Draco, the bright star of the vulture, the left shoulder of Aquarius. There's a, the language of the science in these books is, is quite beautiful to read sometimes. This is a great page too. We have Newton describing how to create, uh, how to take the measurement of the sun's altitude by using a staff divided into 12 parts and looking at the shadow of the staff. Newton was obsessed with shadows and could famously tell you the time of day just by looking at a shadow on the ground. Um, here we have a little drawing of a hand. This is known in rare book and manuscript circles as a manicule um, or a little pointing hand. It's essentially a, a mnemonic device or a reminder that this passage is important and should be heeded well. You can see the mathematical data, the astronomical data going across the page spread here as well. You might notice at this point in the notebook that the handwriting on the left page is actually different than the handwriting on the right page. You can see here, for instance, the old R and throughout. And over here, a more modern looking R in her. So this is actually a point in the notebook where Newton has stopped writing in it and come back to it many years later to add more information. So I mentioned the two different forms of handwriting. Here it is on display. So we have a few more notes on science in this section. Uh, this is a, 
section on building a Copernican model of the universe, so Systema Mundanum Secundum Copernicum, system of the world according to Copernicus. This is a physical model, maybe something Newton actually built himself that doesn't survive. We have some more recipes here against the plague, a water for ulcers. Down here, some information on how to make a perpetual motion machine. And this was probably taken from the work of Cornelis Drebbel, a Dutch engineer who created such a machine and presented it to a royal court in Europe. And he's most famous actually for creating the first navigable submarine. Um, interesting guy. We have down here instructions for building a perpetual lamp involving a wick made of salamander's wool. Salamander's wool sounds really uh, impressive. It's really just asbestos, basically. Um, and anyone familiar with the fireplace of the East Room of the McKim building will know the salamander um, in fire depicted on the fireplace. Salamanders were conventionally thought to live in fire, hence the name salamander's wool. Here we have some notes on building a sundial. Again, something Newton did obsessively as a boy, building sundials all over the place and taking uh, the time based on shadows and mathematics. Then finally, some more recipes to preserve roasted meat. Well, some of these are quite gross and I can entertain questions later about those. And how to make an excellent good writing ink. Um, no self-respecting scholar and manuscript compiler in this period um, did not have a good ink recipe. Finally, a few other bits of calculation, scientific de data, uh, information about the four, uh, the four stars that make up the head of Draco in the constellation Draco. Some notes on planar and spherical trigonometry. Again, you can see the math spilling over the page opening there. We often think of the page of a book as the main unit of meaning, but in fact, the opening of the book is often as much a unit of meaning as the page. And then finally, some questions in navigation. And I love this bit down here. Zoom in on it here. He writes, note that these, math, these nautical problems may be resolved in numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is really, really captures Newton's great contribution to science and why his work ushered in the age of modern science applying quantitative methods to observable natural phenomena. Um, and here he is doing that in a problem of navigation that seems to be related actually to longitude, which was not yet discovered. So we can see in the notebook, we, we now are going through a series of blank pages. And then we get to a part where everything seems upside down. Oops, did, did they image this wrong? What's going on here? In fact, it's supposed to be upside down. Um, and I'll get to this slide. Here we go. There we go. Uh, this is known, this is a, a, a format of keeping a notebook in which you would start on one side, write a bunch, and then flip the notebook over and start writing from the other side, essentially writing what would appear to be upside down if you were coming from the other direction. This is known as a tet besh head to foot binding, um, and it was quite common in manuscript notebooks at this time. There are Notebooks that might have culinary recipes on one side and then medicinal recipes on the other, for instance. So a kind of uh, thematic separation of the contents. These, these also appear in 20th century sci-fi novels, such as The Beasts of Coal. Were they cavemen, supermen, or both? Um, haven't read this one, but it looks, looks fascinating. This is a series called The Ace Doubles. Um, from the other side of the notebook, Newton kept notes about linguistics and language. So it was a very different um, kind of content. He basically copied out uh, material from this book. You can see a very bad reproduction here on the left. Um, a, a, basically a, a school text of English, Latin, and Greek by a man named Francis Gregory. Um, Newton would adapt this material greatly. He would add to it. Um, he would completely change the way it was organized. You can see here that he actually references the Gregory section on birds by just saying, see nomenclaturum page 37. We see page 37 here in the section on birds. There's a table of con this is a table of contents of the sections Newton created for this notebook. And he greatly, as I, as I mentioned, rearranges the kind of classifications and headings that originally appeared in the Gregory. 
This really suggests Newton was doing something very different with these lists. It's not just vocabulary for schoolboys. It's more akin to a cataloging or a categorizing project, a way of organizing his world through nomenclature and classification that he may have borrowed from a printed book, but really made his own in this manuscript. This section uh, is a great example. It's titled Of Man, His Affections and Senses. And it conflates three or four separate sections from the source text. Um, Gregory had separated out uh, things like body parts, the five senses, and emotions and understanding and elements related to intellect. Newton conflates all of them into one list. And it really creates an interesting read as a list. So you see um, black, brown, and blue, so colors that the senses might, might observe but also boldness, bashfulness, behavior, bitterness, blushing. Um, these are just really interesting lists. Dream, doubting, despair. <clears throat> a fascinating uh, look, I think, at the way Newton can take a source and change it uh, for his own ends. Later in the, this section, Newton is adding material again in this later handwriting. And this, this information is quite interesting. So it's mainly notes on phonetic, uh, symbols that might be used with English. It notes about the biology of linguistics. In the middle here, notes about different short and long vowels and the consonants and what part of the mouth and throat produce these sounds. And then on the far right here, two versions of a uh, stock familiar letter written to a loving friend. The first written in normal English and the second written in this sort of phonetic English. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a really interesting look at the way Newton was experimenting with something like phonetics and linguistics, something he's not known for at all, but that he was pursuing and interested and curious about at a certain point in his life. Many scholars, of course, were very interested in trying to discover a sort of phonetic, a universal phonetic alphabet or language at this time. Um, Newton did not really contribute to that, but these notes show that he was, he was interested in it at one point. Um, and these sections really show his intellectual versatil versatility, I think. So to conclude and just to think about the structure of this notebook more generally, um, especially the two sides of it, that Newton flipped the book upside down and started writing from the other end. We see that one side of the book is technical, it's chemical, mechanical. It describes how the world works. The other side of the book is more linguistic, more literary, how language works, but how language is applied to the observable world. We also see that the structure of the book unfolds across time. The beginning of both sides were written much earlier in the schoolboy hand that Newton took from grammar school. And the sections in the middle of both sides were written later in the handwriting that he would develop at Cambridge University. It's also clear that the earlier sections are connected to books that he was reading. He's either copying or paraphrasing or selectively adapting that material. The later sections, however, cannot be similarly traced to printed books and probably derived from a multifaceted scheme of learning while Newton was at Cambridge. He was a famous autodidact. Uh, you know, there was not much mathematical instruction at Cambridge when Newton first got there, for instance, not until 1664, really. So we can see in the very structure and materiality of this notebook, one of the world's great scientific minds evolving. At first gathering and adapting information from books on hand, and later analyzing and compiling scientific knowledge in a way that anticipates the great intellectual and experimental work for which he is known. So I encourage you all to take a closer look at the notebook and also to look at some of these other uh, sources that I've listed here on this slide. And I'm happy to send any of these through the chat as well. Um, biographies, uh, transcriptions of Newton notebooks, uh, a whole website on Isaac Newton's alchemy, which is an aspect of his career that not many people know about. And of course, the great trove of Newton notebooks at Cambridge University, um, almost all of which I believe have been digitized. And even some are, are quite early notebooks like the one we have.